riding down Highway 61 Sides of the roads all lined with fields Nothing but sunset in the windshield Feel it as soon as I ride into town This is where I go to slow guys Brad Chapel back at the Crappie Expo Birmingham Alabama man it's a beautiful venue beautiful city man Lee I'm kind of jealous of all the things to do in Alabama right here it's just great food great people sweet home Alabama has been really welcoming to the crappie community looks like uh, first thing I want to do is introduce both of these guys and I've known them for numbers of years, and I think we're going to gain a lot from this podcast today. But go ahead and Lee, kick it off and do a little introduction for yourself. Yeah, I mean, uh, most of you guys know me. I'm Lee Pitts, Bobby Garland Pro Staffer. Uh, I'm a guide here in Alabama on the Coosa Chain of Lakes. Most uh, Weiss Lake, Neely Henry are kind of my two home lakes, I guess you would say. Yeah. And, uh, I, still, I still travel around some of the further southern lakes. Awesome. How can somebody look you up? What's the best way to get a hold of you? The best way is uh, look up Lee Pitts on Facebook. Uh, and I also have a Lee Pitts Outdoors. And or you can just give me a call. I'm, I'm not a big not co- hard to find. I, I'm not hard to find. Absolutely. You, you can look me up. Absolutely. Gary? Gary Dallahan, Bobby Garland, Crappie Baits. I've uh, been involved with the brand for about the past 17 years. So, <laughs> yeah. as you know, Our relationship goes back a long time with Bobby Garland, and uh, obviously you've been very influential in a lot of our designs and colors, as has Lee in uh, the past several years as well. So it's an honor to be here beside both of you guys and talking about uh, something that's really dear to my heart. Absolutely. You know, and I think of both of these guys, I've got kind of both ends of the spectrum with us today. I've got Gary here with the manufacturing and everything that goes into the brand of Bobby Garland and how different baits are made and colors. And like Lee and myself, we're in the using side of things. And we're the guys that usually call up Gary and say, hey, would you please make this color for me? You know, I have- For me. For me. For me. <laughs> well, in the official world, would I <laughs> no, say me? I understand, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's been such a blessing and great opportunity to be in the sport of crappie fishing and especially involved with this end of things and fun but one of the things that we're going to bring out first off in the show and a lot of the guys that's watching and listening have heard about it already but i want to bring you on the show to kind of talk about this bait tell us the whole thing how this live roamer has came about yeah brand new introduced at this crappie expo is the new bobby garland bait the live roamer mm-hmm. and uh, this this is something that uh, you know I've, I've had in my mind a couple of years but from the time that i've spent in the boat uh, certainly with you uh you know the last couple of years and then a couple of other guys in and around the oklahoma area dustin mcdaniel big influence on what we've done here but every outing and, and being a passionate angler myself and loving to crappie fish, I'm, all, I'm always always looking, thinking, asking questions about stuff. And, you know, the fact that our, our itty-bit slab hunter in particular yeah. has been a very prominent favorite among the guys that are targeting individual roaming fish. Right. So looking at that, looking about how the crappie are reacting to it and what the anglers are looking for in a very subtle presentation that you can put right in front of that crappie that doesn't scare the fish off, that doesn't intimidate the fish and makes it almost irresistible for them to pass up on it. 
So I knew that that small was important for that. Yeah. And that it had to have a natural look and really minimal action. It seemed like from what I observed over the last three or four years of a lot of time in the boat with guys who are, are using forward-facing sonar that the less action employed, the more successful they were with that. So in looking at that, felt like that if we had a bait that you could rig flat so that it would show up well on sonar, but it would have its own kind of natural action to it. It's not an intimidating size. Knowing that itty bit was a very popular choice for that is a very popular choice for that. I wanted it to kind of be in that a little bit bigger than the itty bit, but not as big as a baby shad. So, right. so it came up with a unique size for that in the one and three quarter inch size. I wanted it to look realistic, so we, we truly made this bait look like a, a real minnow, a live minnow, look like a shad imitation. So that's kind of the look and design for this. But for it to be adaptable for a variety of situations, I felt like it had to be perfectly symmetrical, unlike a minnow that's got a fat back and a thin belly. So if you look at what we did with the live roamer, it's truly symmetrical where both sides of it, if you hold it, lay it flat on the table, both sides of it are exactly the same yeah. thickness through there. So that means you can rig it flat. And it was surprising to me when I started working with uh, you know, with you and Dustin and some of the guys, and we were looking on the early development of this, the first thing you would do would rig it upright. I thought, mm -hmm. that, that's really interesting because yeah. in my mind, everything was rigged flat. But then when you look at this, knowing it's symmetrical, rigging it upright makes perfect sense. And if you hold that bait with one flat and one rig side by side upright and watch the tail, you have two totally different tail actions. So that was a real eye opener to me that really hadn't thought about in the development aspect of this where if you're holding that flat and that tail is flat, that tail vibrates up and down, yes. which I see in a, in a live presentation. If you hold it upright, that tail is left to right in a natural swimming action. So yeah. it was fun watching you guys play with that bait. And, and you know, when, I, when, when we talked about it, when we did our little outing on Grand Lake, I said, I'm not, I'm not going to lead you into any interpretation of it. You know, I want to see what you guys do with this. So it was fun watching you guys <laughs> develop your own likes and and methods and techniques that you employed using this new bait. You know, one thing you, you think about, and a lot of these are two-tone laminate colors, you know, like this color here has a dark back, blue back, and a, a clear bottom, which in turns, in my mind, it gives me two different total uh, color presentations when I can use this bait. You know, you can use the dark color up top, or you can re-rig it and have the clear up top. So it's giving me even more, or I can rig it flat. So it's actually three different ways to utilize this bait in my mind. And uh, I shot a video and the other day, I could tell that the fish wanted, say, the pink on the bottom more than the pink on top. So you can, there's not a bad way to rig this bait, in other words. That, that's, that's true. That, that was one of the real takeaways that I had on that outing that uh, we did on Grand was, was when both you and Dustin on your own on separate occasions, <laughs> neither without even conferring each other, you both picked up on that fact pretty fast. Yeah. And, and uh, that first morning with, with Dustin where we were out in the early morning hours and we had a dark sky with some clouds and stuff, and, and he, he consciously re-rigged that and reversed it from what is the normal orientation right. of that. And then later that afternoon, the mid-afternoon with you, you did exactly the same thing underneath yep. that bridge. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. yeah, and that's one of the things I picked up on the bait is, you think of it and you only see two ways to rig it. But in, in reality to me, it gives me three options because I can flip that color to a whole nother color presentation to present to fish because there's not really a, a top side or a bottom side as we normally think of say like a stroller you know the the flat side i'm always going to rig up but in this bait i can flip it either way and i always talk about details when it comes to crappie fishing and that's a detail that i can fine tune even more that <laughs> yeah, i really that like true. and that's yeah. the things that just keep me up at night <laughs> thinking well, that's, about that's the, always been you know that the time that i have spent with you both on the phone and in the boat is you talking about I want the fish to tell me what they want yeah and you're always switching up and you know it's been fun through this process talking with Lee that I, I rely on a lot for a lot of input from, from what we're doing in, in regards to colors and 
perspective. And, and every time we'd visit, I'd keep telling him updates on this base. He goes, so when am I going to get some of these new bases? When am I going to get some of these new bases? I bet he's got a pocket full right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to sneak some out. Well, I know you're going to. I know I will, too. You know, but we go back to, to color selection, and I want to kind of talk to even Lee on he's fishing every day on the water. How do you go about selecting colors? And, and I'll give my even thought on color selection when you're starting out a morning and I know you've got a lot of experience on the particular waterways that you're at, so you've got a general idea where you're going, but how do you fine tune color selection? Because people always ask, well, how do you select colors? There's so many colors out there. Just even on the Bobby Garland brand, there's so many colors, but how do you go back there and really put on your boat and say, all right, I need to select this kind of color to start out with and let the fish dictate, but how do you go about colors? You know, it's uh, every day's different. And, and you know that, and it changes hourly sometimes yeah. instead of just day by day. It, it could change two or three times through a day when you're out there fishing. The the biggest thing that I do, and uh, I've, I've got a, a little bit of an advantage on that because sometimes I'm using multiple rods. Yep. So when I can really, really use my electronics and I'm watching these fish, watching them, how they're bunched up, where they're sitting, and uh, another key to that is, of course, with your daylight. If you've yep. got a cloudy day, yep. if you've got a little bit of wind chop or something like that, uh, it may make a difference. But I can, just like you said, I can let those fish determine what they're wanting, what they're looking for at that particular time. And it doesn't take too many passes through some fish. When, when you can tell if they're not laying just flat on the bottom and they're up and it's fish that will feed, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't take too long to kind of figure out that color scheme. What about, you You mentioned it right there a little bit about the cloudy, darker days. Do you have a, a general rule of thumb that you try to start out with? And I know we're always gonna let the fish tell us. Right, uh, yeah, and it's, uh, I, I like my darker colors. Yep. You know, I, I like to, uh, you know, something with some black, black chartreuse, you know, that gumdrop's always good. Yep. I, I like that. Uh, and, and then also water clarity. Right. You know, that's one of the things we here in uh, North Alabama and Mid Alabama with our Coosa chain of lakes, we're we're dealing with some typical more stain water yeah. than, than some of these uh, lakes surrounding us, and so uh, you know I, I have a lot of my clients are out there and they they say, hey man, what's what's the joke? I'll have some pink tied on, mm -hmm. you know, something with some pink chartreuse, uh, even. Uh, I like those pink heads, you know, those, those crappie pro heads. I'll put some pink on there too, and um, they, they think it's funny, and all of a sudden we start getting eat. <laughs> They're like, <laughs> give me some more. <laughs> then they know it's serious. That's right. And, you know, for me, and I think the same basic scenarios, and I, Gary probably was reading my mind already because we've talked for so many times about colors, and I am like a color junkie yeah. I guess is a yeah. good term yeah. <laughs> I am a color junkie but you know bright days I like bright colors with a lot of glitter on there and if I start out in the morning and it's real bright and sunny I want something that's going to flash in that water column and then you know if you get in some situations where it gets really cloudy and I've, I've got an example I'm going to share with you guys on color but if it's dark you know, and this has actually got glitter in it, and it's really appealing, but it, this is a, a darker color day to me, except for the glitter, and that kind of brings it to another tone. You know, uh, if I've got mixed clouds and, and I've got some sun still shining, I like a bait with glitter, and I'm not going to lie. Kind of a little rap funny, but um, I, I like glitter on bright, sunny days. Uh, like lights out, and this is a good example on a, a dark cloudy day that I'm going to probably put on because it doesn't have glitter and I want that whole bait to, to really silhouette silhouette in the water column without glitter and lights out would be a, a darker cloudier day bait that I would try try first fish will surprise you though you know this is nothing that's set in stone that this is going to work or it's not going to work on a particular day so that's my general rule bright days I'm gonna use a lot of glitter and natural tone and brighter colored baits. If it gets cloudy, I'm gonna use less glitter and darker color baits. 
Um, last week actually was on a guide trip in really for the last month. We've had pretty much no rain in central Mississippi at all. And every day's been uh, bright and sunny and hot. My colors for the last really three weeks have been a white, bone white, chartreuse, monkey milk, glacier, mud dauber, you know, lighter natural tone color baits. And the fish have reacted to them every single day. We pitch out to them, comes across them, the fish recognizes, and and they come and eat them. Now, last week we actually had a, I can't say a cold front, we had a cool front move yeah. through one day, and it moved through right about lunchtime, and all morning we had we, we were burning them up, just fish after fish after fish, and fish never did move, and all of a sudden I see this front move through, and you can see a wall cloud, you know, moving upon us, which it never did rain, but it got dark and around lunchtime, and we kept fishing with the same colors that I had been using, and the fish stopped reacting totally. They, I mean, I, was, I knew the, the presentation hadn't changed as far as bringing it to the fish, but they just totally stopped reacting. And, and I told uh, the, the gentleman's name's actually Tony Van Norman. He's been fishing with me years, a really good client of mine. And I said, Tony, I said, we're about to change colors of baits. And he's like, why would we do that? We, we've been catching fish for the last four hours on this color. I said, well, no, we're changing. I said, notice how dark it's gotten because of these clouds. And we turned around and I ducked in my box and, and got out, um, actually bluegill fire in the itty bit slab hunter, and which is a dark color bait with a hot pink tail. First cast to the fish. I, it was I couldn't have written a better script for it actually. First cast out to it, come across the bait. He recognizes. He comes in and snaps it, and he's like, "That's crazy." And I was like, "All right, next fish you're going to do the same thing. Next fish he sees, cast out to it." fish sees it comes around and eats it automatically so i'm still a or even with live sonar that was a big thing in the beginning that color really didn't matter i can tell you in my perspective color definitely matters it made all the difference between fish totally norm for you know 10 20 minutes however long it was until we changed color from a a, a lighter color to a darker color and the fish responded that quickly absolutely Another thing is we've got so many different profiles. You know, I know Lee's color, or bait profiles, he's got these slab slayers. And we've got different size slab slayers from two inch to three inch, all the way to the itty bit slab hunter, which Gary's playing with right there. And people always ask us, you know, which one do you choose? And I understand that because it does get confusing out there. It, it does very much so, and I, you know, it, it, and I have fun telling the story. And you know, it was, it was June mm-hmm. two years ago when you and I were on Ross Barnett, mm-hmm. and you had had that good bite going on yeah. with what you had been doing, both with uh, with some cork fish and some spider rigging through there, and, and you know, we kind of had a slow, <laughs> cloudy day, and yeah. the fishing was slow. And I put on that little itty bit slab hunter, and I, I remember vividly. Me too. You kept watching that thing. You kept watching it. You go, what is that? Yeah. Give me one of those. <laughs> and the first thing Brad does is he, he goes over there, drops his poles down off of a stump that he can see fish on, put that little thing on our 48th ounce jig head, split yeah. shot on it, make that first cast, and wham. Yeah. Big crappie. And you sat there and wore them out. And about a week later, Brad calls me up and goes, I got a new favorite bait. <laughs> and he been slab hunter. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, you know, those were postponed fish. They were kind of a, a grumpy mood. They didn't want to chase baits. And uh, the change of the profile uh, was definitely key. And, you know, and I've been telling people this for really since the itty bit slab hunter, which is, like I said, it's probably up there with my taper, t- uh, top favorite bait right now. But yeah. when fish are lethargic and, and they're, and I think of summer and I think of winter being very similar to, to bait profiles for me. I'm wanting to, when these fish are more lethargic and it can be caused by heat, it can be caused by 
cold fronts, cold weather, any kind of weather that really affects fish until when they're not feeding as aggressively, I go down to smaller baits. Flat out is my mindset. Hot, cold, anything that front-wise that affects them not to have as much uh, reaction and don't want to chase down a bait, I'm going to go down to a smaller profile. Fall, spring, kind of similar time frames as far as fish being aggressive. Fall, they're getting aggressive because they're wanting to feed up and build up fat reserves and really feed up in the springtime, they're wanting to feed heavily because they're spawning. So I go up in size baits in the fall and the spring. So automatically when I think of which the old workhorse of crappie fishing would be the original baby shad, it works a lot of times year round. But when I go into the uh, springtime and fall, you know, and I can have a faster presentation and uh, I'm going to go to bigger style baits. That's kind of my mindset when it comes to profiles is mid-size to larger pro size profile baits up to a three inch slab slayer I use a lot of times in the spring and even in the fall whenever they're aggressive feeding. And the thought process to me is the bigger the profile and the more aggressive fish the further away they can see it, the further away they're going to come and attack it. Smaller profiles, I have to be a little bit closer typically for them to come get it. But a bigger profile, they'll make a, a bigger jump and go get them. Yeah. Hopefully that comes across I, in the, I, the I, right mindset. I, I think, yeah, I think it definitely does. What about you, Lee? I know, what are some of the profiles and you think of profiles that, and why do you use different? Profiles. Well, that, that's what I was just sitting here, kind of listening to what you said. And uh, weather, yeah, I, I think crappie are more affected by weather than any other fish out there. Yeah. And, and what people don't realize, a lot of times, it does not have to be a very major change. I mean, you you can look at just a little bit of cool air or just a little bit of cloud cover or something that that makes a big big difference for these fish right and like i said we have so many applications with uh, our gallon products that we got it all covered with it <laughs> um and and the same thing going it may change three or four times a day like, like we said earlier yeah i i still like you know with the uh, my slab slayers miniminders things like that uh Very it's just nice. a good all-around bait that uh can pretty much cover everything that i'm going to be doing um, through my day and, and like you said too to downsize a lot of times it, it's these these fish will get um, it's almost like they'll sell up a little bit and don't right. want to play right so uh, you know you got to have something else and I like to downsize it too especially in my cold months mm -hmm. when it really really gets cold and these fish are more lethargic they don't want to chase they don't want to get out there and really run a bait down it's something I can slow down. I can use a lighter head with that and, and really keep it in the strike zone a whole lot longer. And, and I think that's the key to it. Uh, if, if you can keep it right there around his face, he's going to get mad and jump on it sooner mm -hmm. or later. You know, it's kind of my thought process when it comes to uh, the strike zone. And that terminology wasn't as big as it is now with live sonar you know, let's say 10, 15 years ago, we didn't talk about strike zones like we do now, but with the live sonar development through the years, we've realized that strike zone is such a major player when it comes to crappie fishing, more than it ever was given credit beforehand. And, and what I mean when I say strike zone, to somebody new might be listening, is it's the distance a fish will travel to attack a bait. Um, as the fall progresses, this strike zone might actually increase from right now a foot to two foot to as far as 10 feet. These fish will travel 10 feet to go get a bait away from them, their location. Um, but strike zone expands and it contracts depending on these different conditions and, and different seasons almost. The, the thing with small profile baits that I've really noticed too is you've got to pay attention to those 
really like bites more than whenever they're attacking a, a say, a three-inch slab slayer. Typically, when they hit a three-inch slab slayer, they're going to smoke it. They're yeah. going to attack it. Yeah, they're you, wanting to kill it. You'll feel that thump. You're going to feel that thump. With these small profiles, a lot of times, you might only see your line twitch, just a tiny little tickle almost. And that's typically what they, they've got to do. And what I mean what they got to do is to kill a bait, no matter that shad size, as they're feeding naturally, a bigger bait, they've got to hit it harder to kill it. Yeah, that's true. These small baits, they pretty much can inhale them and just digest them. It's not as much work for them. Just like uh, Lee was saying about them being lethargic, a small bait, they pretty much just suck them in, digest them, and be done with it. A three-inch bait, you know, they've got to kill it before they can digest it. So I, I think in my mind, if I was going to start out crappie fishing, these little bits can be deadly for sure. But if you have to feel that thump, go to the bigger style baits, especially in the fall and the winter time. And then you can fine tune it to these harder baits and use an itty bit to say. So it's that's why we have so many different profiles out there. Yeah, and that's that's probably there's there's two questions that I get asked a lot when they look at, you know, like our table here that we've got yeah. all of our body styles, most of our colors out, and it takes up a full six foot table. Yeah. And the question is, do you really need to have all these different profiles? Do you really need to have all these different colors? Or are you just trying to catch more fishermen? Yeah. And, I, and you know, my response is really pretty easy because what you see here have come from input from the fishermen. Each one of these profiles has a specific purpose it was designed for. We didn't just go build a bait and say, hey, we need another bait, let's do this. Each one has come from guys like you, guys like the ones we visited with here at the show, and, and a lot of the ladies too have been very influential on, you know, what I have seen, and we, we take that feedback and digest it, so every profile that we have come up with, we've done because it has fit a particular purpose. Right. That, that ranges, that, that goes from the mayfly to the minnow minder to the stroller. You know, you can remember back when we started talking <laughs> about this stroller, and what needed to be different about this bait versus what yep. was out there with the little action tail grubs. And we came up with that big thumping tail that this bait has. So when you look at our entire product line, whether it's Slab Doctor, Split Tail, Baby Shad, New Live Roamer, each one of these profiles has its own story for a very specific purpose. Right. What I have learned since that time is when we come out with one of these styles, <laughs> that the fishermen are the one that quickly tell us how much more you can do with that bait, just like we talked yeah. about with the live rover, than what we had in our original mind for the intention of developing that. Same way with the colors. You know, do you have all these colors to catch more fish or more fishermen? Well, again, it's, it's come from a specific need, most of the time from anglers themselves that have said, you know, what if you took this color off of that electric chicken and put it up with uh, this color off of your, you know, your, your bluegill colored bait. What would you get with it? A guy named Brad Chappell does that quite yeah, often to us. Yeah. So, <laughs> I'm <and> guilty. He, <laughs> so, so, so yes, I mean, first and foremost, we do these things because there is a need for it. And yeah, there had been a time or two where we felt like we had a really good name for a color, didn't know what it looked like. Right. And I say, hey, Take this name and build me a color for it, but most of the time it's coming up with the color first and the name of it afterwards. Absolutely, and it's kind of like the Mayfly, and it, this is a, a fairly new bait for probably but not for one second year. year yep. One year. Yep. The second year it's been in production, and and the hunter showed on the screen as well. But this bait was designed why? To well, fit a need. To, yeah, insect profile. Insect profile. profile. It's all about profiles. You know, profile, profile. Is, a, is a whole new determination. And, you know, that, that again, that's another development like you talked about uh, from live sonar application. Profile has become a key a key term. So that gave us a totally different profile from the from the, uh, the minnow type aspect. Right. But that's, that's where the mayfly came about. You know, it even goes back to the mayfly. And I think back to this bait um, this particular year. I had a, a cancellation, and so of course I, I have my boat out there, so I'm going to go fishing anyway. 
and I get out on the lake and it was a, a slick calm day and we have mayflies flying around everywhere and of course I'm gonna grab a mayfly then because it's just like light bulb there's there's the bait everywhere and match the hatch match the hatch <laughs> and all of a sudden I put one on and notice a fish and I'm using live sonar then I, I see a fish suspended out in the water column drop the bait down to it and you the strike zone effect the profile effect that fish recognized this bait about six to eight feet away from them falling and as soon as it saw it, it took off like a little rocket ship coming to it and inhaled it. And it was because of Match the Hatch. Yeah. You know, this is a food source for these fish that they were actively hunting for that day because they were abundant and those fish were taking advantage of them. And the thing that I've learned even with mayflies is they hatch all through the summertime. It's not just in the month of May. This bait will be very good throughout who knows as far, but I know last week I seen mayflies hatch. Well, it was interesting. A gentleman came by yesterday and he, he looked, he picked up one of those mayfly baits. He goes, I just saw two weeks ago here in Alabama, yeah. probably the biggest mayfly hatch of the season. Yep. That, and he goes, that's probably the latest one I have seen here, but he goes, it was it was the biggest one of the year. We, we had last year on a Weiss Lake and it was the, I think the 6th of October and had another Sixth big of hatch October. up, yeah. up river on the Coosa. Hey, and I think that's kind of weird when you think of the the insect name mayfly, you think of the month of May, and I don't want fishermen to realize that this bait can be utilized throughout the year, just not in the month of May, but let the fish kind of tell you on these profiles, and kind of, I wanted to give everybody a general starting place on profiles and colors that they can take back and put them in their boat and say, all right, let me try this because of it's cloudy today and what have you. So hopefully we can help some of you guys out there listening and watching on selecting baits. So, I mean, I, I'm always excited about showing new baits out. Well, we, we appreciate what you do with the Cropic Connection because it does open a lot of eyes yeah. beyond what you see as an intended purpose for right. any particular bait and application because, as you have always said, you know, I, I listen to what the fish are telling me, yeah. and, and, and a lot of times it's different than what you start out thinking it's going to be. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, it, you know, you look at some colors, and they're not really eye-catchy when it comes to what they look like. And some days those are the, by far the best color to actually present to the face uh, of those fish. And let them determine what they want to bite, but you got to listen to them to catch more fish and hopefully by today's broadcast with this show it does that lee tell them where they can find you again you can find me on facebook lee pitts or just give me a phone call 256-390-4145 you know lee like i said we we've, we've been buddies for a while now get introduced actually did a today's bite with him about three or four weeks ago we'll do some more with lee look he, forward to it you yeah. know you might not know it, but this this guy can shoot docks pretty well as well. So I'm not that expert. So I want to hear more about dock shooting with Lee in the future. So we'll do some uh, today's bite even with you on that subject line. So I tell you what, that dock shooting's hot, and once you get a get that line skip in there real good and get that one thump, it'll get you coming back for it. Well, guys, definitely make sure you hit your notifications on, subscribe, like, follow. Appreciate everybody. Appreciate Bobby Garland Bates for supporting the Crop the Connection. And, of course, today's bite. Cannot forget Absolutely. about that. Our pleasure. We appreciate you guys. That's on Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Every Tuesday, me and Dustin McDaniel have a fun time. We we'll definitely have a fun time, and we have had a lot of people come by and say they enjoy that, too. So thank you for uh, putting that together for us. Yes, sir. Thank you. Until next time, you got Brad Chapel here. Lee Pitts. Gary Dollahan. Holla. Right a mile from Big Muddy River, a place I'll always remember. A cabin on the lake and a fishing pole. Forever here, I'll rest my soul. I can feel